is our last of the seven churches, Laodicea. As we're rattling up the seven churches in Revelation, I want to point out that there's various views of a multi-layered prophetic aspect to these seven churches. I mean, there's the actual historical churches in Asia Minor that these letters were written to in their context with their specific situation. But we also see in them seven prophetic symbols that extend through the church age until Christ returns. And that's where there are different views of what that may be. Um, there's one view that sees the prophetic uh, aspect of these seven churches of being seven types of Christians through the church age. Seven examples of different kinds of believers. Um, some see as a prophetic view of different kinds of churches that will exist through the church age. And others see this as a prophetic view of the seven periods of church history. And that's probably fairly common uh, if you've heard or studied Revelation in the past. Um, and so it's that idea that we can trace the spiritual state of the church from Jesus' ascension to his return in seven distinct sub-ages, if you will, of the church age. Uh, I think it's worthy of mentioning because Laodicea, in that view, corresponds to Christianity today. We would be that last one, um, if you hold to that view. I lean a little bit more towards this is indicative of all churches from the time Jesus said to the time he returns, but um, I see it worthy of mention. So I'm going to show you what that view of the seven ages within the church age um, looks like. First of all, it's also kind of a review. So Ephesus, we, we learned they were strong in doctrine and practice, but they lost their first love. And that would be the first century church in the days of the apostles. Then it's Smyrna. They were persecuted yet faithful. And that would correspond to the church under persecution between 100 AD and 316. And then there's Pergamum, a persecuted church but compromised. The church mixing with the world during the Middle Ages is what they would believe. Then Thyatira, that was a loving church but tolerant of sin which was not a good mix, and corresponds to the spread of the evil practices and idolatry in the church until the Reformation. Sardis, the church of the living dead, where there was only a remnant of faithful believers, um, and that eventually leads to the Reformation. And then Philadelphia, that was persecuted, had little power, yet they were faithful, and that would correspond to that revival spread of the true gospel being preached after the Reformation. And then, Laodicea, the lukewarm church, corresponding to modern day Christianity. And it does fit nicely if you live in the United States, but if you live in Africa or Iran, it doesn't quite match their situation. So that's why I would be more of the different kinds of churches throughout the church age. But here we are, latest in. And I do believe that out of all churches, this represents us the best. The church of the United States. And so let's check it out. Living luxuriously in latest in. In verse 14, and to the church, and to the angel of the church in latest in, Right. And so here we have a map that will show you where Laodicea is. A map. Out okay. there. <laughs> you my son, so I can call him out like that. <laughs> see it there at the bottom right here. It completes the circuit all the way to the last city and then back to Ephesus. Um, it's located 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia, 100 miles east of Ephesus. 
It's an important city that sat on top of a group of hills in the fer fertile Lycus Valley. Lake Sea was situated on the crossroads of trade and communication. There was major uh, major trade route going east and west between Ephesus and then as far as Syria, which made Laodicea an important stop. But there was another important trade route that started up in the north around Pergamum and went all the way to the Mediterranean coast. And so you can see how it was at a crossroads. Uh, here's a picture of the street called Sirius Street that connects Laodicea to Colossae. The book of Colossians, you know? And so Laodicea was founded by the Seleucid king Antiochus II over 200 years before Christ. He named the city in honor of his wife, Laodicea. I don't know why it's not uh, but Laodicea. Um, water was infamous in Laodicea because it was known for being tepid and unpleasant to drink. It was kind of thick with minerals and then lukewarm. Everybody's favorite drinking temperature. Um, nearby was Aeropolis, six miles north, which was known for its mineral rich hot springs. You can see them right here. People love to bathe in them. They were believed to have healing properties. And then nearby, 10 miles east, was Colossae, known for its pure cold water. Uh, it's kind of Mr. Thurston just talking about. Laodicea did not have a permanent supply of good drinking water. And because they were wealthy, they built aqueducts to bring both hot and cold water to their city. Hot from Aeropolis, cold from Colossae. And by the time that cold water even reached the city, it would become disgusting, mineral-laden, lukewarm water. Suitable for only inducing bottom body, according to some. But the pipes would oftentimes become clogged with all the calcium and other minerals. Now, Lakeside was famous for its silky black wool. And they were very proud of their black clothing which will come into importance at the end when it comes out white, clearly. It was known for its great medical school. It had special eye salves and uh, Phrygian um, powers that would be used to treat eye problems. So Laodicea obtained a lot of wealth, um, not only from medicine, but primarily banking and commerce. It was a wealthy city. And after their city was destroyed by an earthquake in 60 AD, they refused the aid that was offered to them by Rome and said, no, we got it. We got a lot of money here in our city. So they rebuilt their own city at their own expense. And they were very proud of that. Um, their wealth and self-sufficiency made them famous. But we find it's also their wealth and independence that weakened their commitment to Christ. They lived a luxurious life. They were cultured in Greek arts, science, and literature. They were super pleasure oriented. They actually built this large stadium, which since then all those stones were quarried to build buildings. But there was an inscription discovered here that dedicates this stadium to the station in 79 AD. It was used for races, and the length of the track is 600 feet, a, a measurement known as one stadium. Very interesting. The stones, uh, obviously, are not there anymore. Uh, Laodicea also built Battle Street Theaters right here, too, and you'll see one of them here. It was the most prosperous of the seven churches. And it's interesting to know, the two most luxurious churches, Sardis and Laodicea, received the strongest rebuke from Christ. So there is a connection between having lots and struggling with commitment to Christ. Um, the religion there was chiefly 
work, the worship of Zeus, also known as Jupiter. Uh, they also worship the snake god for medicine. Uh, many Jews lived there, and they eventually formed the core of the first church. But Christianity first reached there while Paul was in Ephesus for an extended stay. It appeared that the church in Laodicea was perhaps planted by Epaphras, who also founded the church in Colossae. So Paul didn't actually start those churches, missionaries he sent out of them. Though Paul never visited them personally, uh, at least not that we have record of, he did write them a letter. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he wrote this, And when this letter has been read among them, have it also read in the church of the latest events. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. That's a letter we don't have today. That'd be cool to find it one day. Laodicea was also in church history important because there was a council held there where they determined the canon of Scripture in 361 AD. Excavations actually didn't even start in mass there until 2003. So you'll see a picture here of some excavations. Most who go there to explore Laodicea and excavate stay in the nearby city of Denise, 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 Denise. All right, so let's move on. Interesting? Okay, cool. I'm glad you guys are history nerds. <laughs> the second thing we see, accounting of Christ in Laodicea, in verse 14b, the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, beginning God's creation. Obviously, every time Jesus reveals something about himself, it is actually relevant to the church that he's speaking to. Here, he says the words of the, the Amen. Only one place in the Bible is the word Amen used as a personal name, and that is right here. This is what it means, Amen. Means true, or so be it. So we say amen at the end of a prayer. You're agreeing with it. Acknowledging that which is sure, firm, and valid. Here is the title for Jesus. So this is God's ultimate statement of affirmation and fulfillment to his people. So when God says amen, then you know that's serious, and it's going to happen. In 2 Corinthians 1 20, it says, For all the promises of God, find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And always a great reminder to remember that Jesus is the fulfillment of all prophecies and promises. He's the ultimate fulfillment. So why is it being told to them? Well, because the wealthy often place their hope in riches and Jesus is really the only one that you can trust. When you're looking for riches to provide that safety, comfort, stability, it, it will leave you empty. Jesus is steady, he's unchangeable, and that's important in an unstable world, especially like the one we have today. The second thing he says is that he is the faithful and true witness. The Greek word for witness, we looked at it before, it means martyr. Or it comes from the word martyr. Jesus was a witness of the death. And so what kind of witness? Well, two adjectives. He's faithful and is true. Faithful, characterized, steadfast affection or allegiance. Somebody that can be relied upon. So when you call your spouse a faithful husband or a faithful wife, uh, there should be death to it of that steadfast affection uh, and commitment. And so Jesus is there for you when nobody else is. He's the one friend you can count on. He's also true, which is characterized by not only speaking the truth, but also representing reality accurately. So that means if you really want to know the universe in its real um, state, purpose, and meaning, you need to know Christ. 
Uh, you can trust his words. And, and this is super important for a post-truth generation. I mean, I don't know if you knew that our generation is called the post-truth generation, this current generation, where um, truth doesn't matter anymore. Um, and the maker of truth and so on, but now there is only one truth, and, and his name is Jesus. You know? So if you want stability and truth, Christ is who you want. And then thirdly, he's the beginning of God's creation. Now this does not mean that Jesus was the first created being. The word beginning means first cause. An agent that is the cause of something that does not itself have a cause. If you've heard that in philosophy class, uh, the uncaused cause. Uh, where did everything come from? Well, if you trace back each cause, you know, how did I get here? Well, my parents, and then before them, how did they get here? And, and so on. And if you trace causes back, there has to be a first cause in the universe. But, and then, for that first cause to happen, you have to have an uncaused cause. Um, first John 1 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And also, Colossians 1 17, he is before, there it is, before all things. The uncaused cause. And it, in him all things hold together, and so he also sustains all things. And this is really important for material. Mind people like the Laodiceans to know that Jesus is the cause of creation. Creation, sorry. It, it means that he actually created all the stuff that they've been putting their trust in. And so you don't put your hope in creation, you put it in the creator. Well, confrontation. We see now in verses 15 through 19. First, there's spiritual indifference. In verse 15, I know your words. You were neither hot or cold nor hot. What did you were either cold or hot? So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Well, sometimes it's important to comfort the afflicted. You know what I mean? You hope that happens when people come to church and they experience affliction, we want them to be comforted. But sometimes we need to afflict the comfortable. And that's what Jesus does here. He, he rattles the cage. I know your words. Again, he knows us like nobody else does. You know, he sees past the facade. He knows that they were spiritually sick. And that's why he says, you're neither hot, cold, nor hot. A cold doesn't mean like super sinful and then hot on fire for, for Jesus. And that sometimes is the way this is perceived, um, being cold and rebellion and then hot on fire for the Lord. Um, think of it this way. You know, we just stopped by to get some pretty stuff away here. And uh, Alec wanted a peppermint mocha. So I was surprised, but the, 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 through the drive through they're like, do you want that hot? And I was thinking, I'm like, well, what other way? It's freezing outside. <laughs> now, in some time, a uh, cold peppermint milk would be refreshing, right? Uh, winter time, that warm peppermint milk uh, soothes your hands and it soothes your body when you get sick. Um, and so, what we're talking about here is what is useful for the situation, you know? Um, Cold drinks are refreshing, hot drinks are soothing. And, and so cold water quenches the thirst. Hot mineral water heals and soothes the body. But what do you do with the warm water? It's repulsive, it's useless. Uh, and that's what Jesus says about the church. Man, I wish you were more useful. I wish you were either cold or hot. It would actually affect some sort of positive outcome in this world, but instead there's complacency and compromise and mediocre lifestyle, apathy, indifference. Jesus confronts them for their unsavory lifestyle and gener general uselessness. You see, they had been lulled into a false sense of security. They had enough church to soothe the conscience, but not enough Jesus to change their lives. And that's where a lot of 
churches are, and even in Christians and in the Western world, we have it so good. We have it so easy. I mean, we don't have to be on dirt floors. We don't have to walk five miles to church. We don't have to sit on wooden chairs. Um, it, it, we have it so easy, and we forget it sometimes. Um, and we can be rolled into a false sense of security or spirituality, especially in our country. You know, and we have we have it pretty good. Even the poor are rich in the eyes of people from other parts of the world. We have a strong military. We live in the city. I mean, I don't really worry <laughs> most of the time about um, Red Dawn, although I was really worried about it when I was a kid. My friends and I, you know, we dug ditches and, you know, make little uh, covers with branches and we made traps and all these things just in case the Russians came. We were ready. Um, but I don't worry about that, you know? But other parts of the world, it's very different. And so the church wavered between two mindsets of holiness and worldliness. And the, the Bible warns us against this. In James 4.4, 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And then Jesus says this, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he, he, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. And so with Jesus, it's either on or off. There's no middle, almost on or off. You know, if you've ever tried to get your light switch right in the middle, it doesn't usually work. It's either on or off. Even if it isn't middle, it's either on or off. You know, there's, there's no way. But we're just kind of Dims unless you got a temper. And that's the way it is in Christ. See, they're on. So, how do we grow with the Lord? Sometimes it happens because we've trusted in the wrong things, a life of ease. We love entertainment, good food, relaxation, vacation, and rest, and lack of stress, and user friendliness. I mean, it's all the stuff the church growth experts are telling us to, to uh, sell, so to speak. You sell this to people when they walk in the door. Uh, a nice, crispy flyer and uh, a free gift and um, awesome coffee and rock concerts and lasers, you know. Um, you want to have a, a, a comedy entertainment experience and whatnot, but a life of ease. When the church becomes consumers um, of a packaged Christianity, it's lukewarm. The church becomes lukewarm when it's no longer willing to make a sacrifice to follow Christ, or no longer willing to suffer for Him with regards to their reputation. But sometimes it can happen when we become so familiar with the things of God, but we lose touch with the person of God. You know, Bible College, they had speakers coming in all the time. And my first year at Bible College, it was like uh, every speaker was um, world-changing, world-shattering messages that would, you know, get you all pumped up and ready to quit and move to the mission field right now, you know? And at first, that's the way it is, but over time, you start getting used to it. And then you start thinking, ah, oh, here's another one. And you grow into them. And the question in our minds is, have you been tamed by the enemy? Or are you still a danger to his kingdom? You know? Well, lukewarmness can really slip. You can know, really slip into it. And Jesus says, this is how he responds to the formness. I will spit you out of my mouth. Okay, so that's what you're really thinking, right? That's the idea of spit is literally to vomit. So I'm sorry if you have a weak stomach. You probably don't stick around with me very long if you have a weak stomach, so I'll talk about gross stuff all the time. 
<laughs> to vomit, to, to eject the contents of the stomach through the mouth. And just in case you didn't know what vomit was. <laughs> Obviously, it's a metaphorical rejection with extreme disgust. That, that's when. That's what it means just in terms of how Jesus feels about the lukewarm. So really, it's kind of a vulgar term, but it's meant to shake up the modern reader. It's meant to cause us to understand the gravity of the situation that Christ detests and rejects the attitude of compromise and indifference. So he's harsh, dispassionate. And interestingly, I think the world, at least those in the world that want to see a truth, and they're seeking Jesus, it causes them to feel pretty sick too. You know, usually it's the Christian world that becomes the norm. Well, the, the next thing we see in confront is that ignorance of their own spiritual condition. In verse 17, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Man, we just rebuilt our own city at our own expense. We don't even need Rome. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So, this lack of seeing things the way that they really are, it can happen when we start to equate health and wealth with spirituality. Latest news compared their true condition to the wrong skin. Uh, they were looking to what the world felt was healthy and good and successful, and therefore said, well, if we're this, then we must be in God's sight. But it's not good to compare yourself to the wrong standard because it's going to lead you down the wrong path. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it says, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So where do we compare ourselves to? Well, we take ourselves to the Word of God. And Jesus is our standard. They took on the self-sufficient, luxurious attitude of the city that they lived in. They, they stopped praying. Give us this day our daily bread. They were busy enjoying all their creature comforts. But Jesus looks at them and says, okay, you guys are blind. You, you can't even see um, what your condition is, but I can see you clearly in your wretched, pitiable, poor, white, and naked. Their true spiritual condition should have brought them to shame rather than pride. But Jesus points it out, and when Jesus points it out to you, it's always good to listen. Now, if you remember, the church of Smyrna was poor in the eyes of the world, but rich toward God. It said in Revelation 2 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. That's pretty powerful. When you compare it to the latest sins, you, you guys think you're rich, but you're, you're so poor. But Jesus doesn't leave them in their shame. He doesn't just land bless them and, and leave them to wallow in their self pity. He lovingly instructs them how to change. And so notice what he says in verse 18 I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And sad to know your eyes, so that you may see. Interesting that Jesus doesn't say, I command you to this crowd. He says, I counsel you. These affluent people that already had everything, Jesus counsels them. He gives these consumers a spiritual shopping list. You know? You ever love to shop and you feel better when you do? <laughs> well, you can do it right here. You know, switch it. Instead of Amazon, 
take it to Jesus, take it to Jesus' marketplace. And so he, he lists the things. Gold refined by fire. What does that mean? Well, when you see gold being refined by fire in the Bible, usually the fire is persecution or trials or suffering, and the gold is the believer being purified. Jesus is telling them to take a stand for him, even if it means that their rich friends don't invite them to parties anymore. To allow that refining process to happen in their walk, to, to be set apart, to be different than the world. In 1 Peter 1, 7, it says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And you know what the opposite of that is? Until Jesus comes, their life through other people around you will probably do the opposite of glory, praise and honor. Instead, you will be looked down upon. You, you might be teased. You might be excluded. So our Christianity should cause us to put everything at the feet of Jesus. As C.S. Lewis says this, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. And I would venture to guess there is a lot of Christians that walk on this earth that see their faith as moderately important. If Christianity is worth anything, it's worth everything that we have, all that we are. In Luke 9 23, it says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take this cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains a whole world and loses or forfeits himself? So we buy gold refined by fire. True refining experience with Jesus. Only then will we be truly rich now the second thing here is white garments. Remember, they, they were famous for their, their shiny, luxurious black wool in their, their black garments. But here Jesus says, okay, it's time to, to change your clothing because you don't realize that the clothing that you're wearing is more like a fig leaf. It, it doesn't cover your nakedness. Um, and so we clothe ourselves with Christ. You know, when Jesus died for us on the cross, he exchanged our shame and sin. And he became me. And he gave us his works of righteousness. And we became righteous. In Revelation 19, 8, it says, It was granted for her to clothe herself, as speaking of the, the bride of Christ, the church, with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So our righteousness is a gift from Jesus, but then the Holy Spirit begins to work in us to produce righteousness. And then the last thing, go buy some salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now I struggle with dry eyes now um, after chemo. And so uh, now I can relate with my wife. She's always struggling with dry eyes. But um, we have these eye drops that are like, um, they're not like watery eye drops, they're like goop. And so you goop it on your eye and they blink and it's like the whole world goes blurry. And it feels like, uh, you know, you can't see, it's all thick and your eyes stick together. But you just gotta do it for a while and then it rehydrates things. Um, and there are salves. If you've ever had pink eye, you can put drops in there that will heal it and, and clear things up. 
There in the see, it's, they were famous for their saps. And people would go there to clear up eye issues. Although they took pride in their medical achievements, they were unaware of their spiritual blindness. So they couldn't see the way things really were. They needed Jesus' staff. <laughs> Wouldn't you love it if we had a little eye drops at church we could do that? Ooh, now I see things the way Jesus sees them. <laughs> you know, that would be pretty awesome. But there is a way that we can begin to see things the way that he sees them, and, and it's through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You know, the Holy Spirit gives us discernment and insight, and he illuminates the words that can understand it and uh, use the Word as our, our filter for what we're looking at in the world. And so there's the times when you see in the Bible, people didn't see things the way they really were. One is Samuel. When he went to go and meet King David, even Samuel, the prophet, wasn't able to see real well at first, but then God opened his eyes. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Speaking of the older son, for the Lord sees not as man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so when we buy the salve from Christ, we begin to see people the way he sees them. In Luke 16, 15, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He says, you are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So it also says for our values, what we consider virtues. And the Pharisees loved money and power, but in God's sight, that was an abomination. And so how do we see wealth? How do we see success? In verse 19, it says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, and so be zealous and repent. This is pretty powerful. After being reproved and disciplined, Jesus now comforts the afflicted with his love. And the word love here is not a God way. It's the word phileo. So why would it be phileo? Should it be the greatest form of love? Well, phileo is very specific in the sense that it, it expresses warm affection, tender care, and faithful loyalty towards somebody. It's, it's more of the ooey-gooey, mushy stuff. You know? The kind of love that is expressed in a, in a hug and in warm affection. So Jesus says, you know, when I reprove, reprove you and discipline you, it's because I love you so much, like, like a father loves his child. And as we know, Scripture says that God just tells us he loves. Well, there's two commandments here. You see what they are? Two commands. Number one is what? Be zealous. Which means passion. Enthusiastic. Have you become irritated by zealous people? <laughs> it happens when we get kind of critical and old and crusty in our faith. But God wants us to be that zealous person. You know, we just had a little zealous woman right up here a little bit ago. She was so excited. And uh, maybe you've lost that. In Romans 12, 11, it says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. It's a command. Do not be slothful in zeal. And so, we pursue passion for the Lord. And when we don't have it, we pray for it. And if we're looking for it, find some people that are. And then stop being irritated by it when we see it, you know? Um, yeah, sometimes it's a lot of younger believers that are more zealous because they haven't been um, 
shake it. God just wants us to lose that. Okay, second command is what? Repent. Romans 2, 4, do not, or, or do you presume on riches and kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Your God's kindness isn't so that we can keep on doing what we know we shouldn't do. His kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. And so to repent would be, okay, I'm going to stop trusting in my bank account. I'm going to stop trusting in the safety of living in the United States. So These are all good things, but not when we put them for the world. I'm going to stop looking at things the way the world looks at them. Well, the last thing this year is the rewards. Rewards for the overcomers. Verse 20 is probably the most famous verse in Revelation, I would imagine. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. You know, it's often applied to the unbeliever in gospel messages, which, you know, it works, but that's not the immediate context. The immediate context, these are believers. Jesus is at the door of the church, but he's not on the inside. He's on the outside, and he's knocking and saying, Can I come in? What an honor. Jesus is outside the church, and you can also look at this as an individual's heart. He's outside of their heart. They've crowded him out with everything else. The lives are so full of worldly things that there's no room for Jesus. But here, he's so patient and kind that he pursues us, which is cool because he pursues us even when we are not pursuing him. He invites us into intimate fellowship. You know, in the culture of that day, having a meal together was seen as having intimate fellowship with the closest of friends. That you would become one with the person that you ate with because you would be eating the same food, dipping in the same cup, and taking part of the same loaf of bread. And so what was becoming a part of their body was becoming part of your body. So Thayer paraphrases this, this part of the verse, I will make him to share in my most intimate and blissful contacts. I would like to have a meal like that with Jesus. Maybe he's been calling you for some time, you know, and, and you have a track record or some stories of deep fellowship with the Lord, but now you, you, you perhaps you know that he's cr- other things have grabbed him up. And so when you open the door today, when you hear a knocking right now, it's an appeal not only for individuals, but also the church. And so churches are called to not be so filled with stuff that there's no room for Jesus. I mean, honestly, that's one of the reasons I love having community there every week, because we will not miss pointing out Jesus and what he's done for us. Um, and then hopefully during the messages we hear about Jesus, and during the worship we sing about Jesus, you know. In the book of John, John records the words of Christ talking about the Holy Spirit, and he says the Holy Spirit will point you to me. Paraphrase. <laughs> you know, point you to me. And so the Holy Spirit if it's a spiritual church, then what happens? It's not the Holy Spirit being glorified, it's Jesus being glorified. Well, verse 21, kind of an interesting promise here. 
might make you feel a little uncomfortable when you think about it. The, the one who commandeers, I will bring him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. I mean, is that right? To have the motivation to want to sit on the throne of Jesus? Well, he says it's a reward, so it should be. The person that responds by inviting Jesus back into their heart, or the church, too, that responds and, and, and repents and becomes zealous for him, this promise is for them. When I come in glory, you can sit with me. And you can rule with me and reign with me. Just as I sat with my father and ruled and reigned with me. So if we conquer by surrendering to Christ, we're, we're going to participate in this rule. It's not something we talk about a lot. Um, probably because some people take that too far or something too prideful about it, but this is part of the rewards for believers is uh, authority and rule. So what does it look like to sit on the throne with Jesus? In Daniel chapter 7, It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man. And that's Jesus, just to give you a little hint. And he came to the ancient of days, the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom, that all peoples, nations, language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And then in a little bit, Daniel 7, 27, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. And so that kingdom is also given to us. Paul says, but do you not know that all saints will judge the worlds? Wow. And then he says this, do you not know that we are to judge angels? Dang. Well, I have more verses, but we'll just stop there. We're going to rule and reign with Christ, and that is a big reward. It's an important one for the Church of Laodicea to that think they're ruling and reigning like kings on this earth. So many people are looking for that. You know, to get to the place where you got it all. But in so doing, we sometimes leave Jesus behind. Or we cry out. And that's why it concludes with this. He who has near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, this applies to us. Jesus longs to have fellowship with you. And so if you're in fellowship, take it. Take it deeper. You know? Continue on. Don't get discouraged. If you're not in fellowship, this is the way you come. It's like Jesus saying, you know, I'm lukewarm, I'm going to pump it down. It's time to leave that behind. But I'm right here, and I love you. So come back home. But that be it. I just want to have a meal with you. Just want to spend time with you. So let's respond to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Revelation once again, and for this special section that really does apply to us in a lot of ways. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you would give us eyes to see as you search our hearts and our minds. Lord, show us any wicked ways. Show us anything that is crapping you out. Okay, Lord, we pray for that strength to become zealous once again. So we thank you for this time. We're in the courage of the city. Amen.